are so grateful that you have continued to step out from your industry of being, you know, a world-class actor and creative artist and being, expressing yourself more, right. sharing your art, your poetry, your stories, your lessons, and your truths. So it's been a beautiful journey to watch you continue to impact lives, not only on screen, but also off as yourself. So I'm really grateful yeah. that you're doing this. Cool. Uh, thank you. I'm glad it, 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 it's landed that way Yeah. for, for you. Um, it's been challenging and gratifying for me but that it started with the book you've written books uh you know what i what i wanted to do is when, when i'm acting i'm going through, I, I have five filters between my raw expression and what you see on screen five right? someone else's script someone else's character someone else behind the camera uh someone else directing someone else editing that's five filters between me and the raw expression what wrote the book was i said i want to get rid of some of those filters mm. now a book is one filter it's still a written word yes but, and the ultimate is like when people do stand up or performances or like this, we're live. This is no filter. And so that's what I wanted to do where I could direct my own story, be the main character in my own story, edit it through my lens. Mm. And um, it stuck in a way, which was nice to hear the reverb and hear people hear come back to me about what they got from it, the questions they still have about it um, and how it, 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 it help them along their own path in some ways. Did you have any fear doing this? Yeah. Really? Yeah. What was the biggest fear? I don't like looking back over my shoulder, man. Mm. I, I, uh, I mean, I haven't even seen all my movies. Really? <laughs> I like making them more than I like watching them. <laughs> you know, so to look back over 50 years of my life, 40 years of writings was a scary proposition for mm. me because I feared I'd be in having some embarrassments. I feared I'd be shamed about, feel shameful about some things. And I always had, I'd always, I've always written and had the journals, but my, my excuse was, oh, you know, post-mortem, maybe Camilla, my wife, will dig that out. And read them. Right. Right. Like, oh, this is worth putting out. It was always an excuse, right? And um, finally, I got the confidence to go, you know what, no, go, go away and take those boxes of journals and those chests of journals and go see what you got. And I looked at them and I was embarrassed. About you lost. Yeah. What was the thing that you were most embarrassed about? Being a wise thinking I knew stuff. Proclaiming I knew stuff. When I would contradict myself right mm. after. Or I had, you know, times where I would say, ooh, very I look back at the very arrogant. Very, you know, but I but I I've, I come to I've come to understand now that I was doing that to find an identity. And it's youth and the revolutionaries of youth do that. You try it out. Let's test it. Mm -hmm. I know this. It fails. Okay. To the next. Something I don't think we should forget as we get older. We just start to understand context and innuendo and two things can be true at the same time. When you're younger, it's black and it's white. And so I had things that I was embarrassed about that. And what, I, what happened after about 10 days of writing the book and going through some embarrassment and quite a bit of shame... Um, where I also didn't walk the walk, but talk the talk to myself even. Um, I, I started to notice that, oh, well, actually, if you wouldn't have been that sort of all-knowing and what I would call arrogant at this point, you wouldn't have put yourself in the position to learn better or to get mm -hmm. humbled mm -hmm. or to find out, oh, I thought I had it figured out. I didn't. So I was like, okay. So all of a sudden, the embarrassment turned into chuckles. Right. And so now I'm starting to laugh at myself. You stepped <laughs> you talked, you didn't back it up. You ate crow. And that rhythm happened a lot through, through my life. And I think it happens to, 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 to all of us in, in certain ways. And I think one of the things that people got from the book that I got from writing it was people come to me and said, look, I'm taking more risk mm. now. And I think that that's, that's part of it. Like the, when we fail, which is why we, so many of us don't take as many risks. It's never really, not never, but almost always never as really bad as we thought it was going to be. When and we the fail people, at the risk, yeah. Yeah, when we fail at doing it, it's never, the, 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 the letdown's never, in a real measure, as bad as we thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And the people that are going, nah, 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 blah, 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 they're on the sidelines for a reason. Mm -hmm. You play football. Yeah. They're over there, they're in the bleachers with the whistle in their mouth for a reason. But the ones that are on the field trying out stuff with you, they're right there next to you going, hey, man, me too. <laughs> I blew it over here, or I blew it here, but thanks for taking the shot. Thanks for trying. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot that's something that uh, a lot of people got from the mm -hmm. book. So the shame and the embarrassment turned into humor 
And then I noticed that I consistently step in the same pot. There's quite a few times. <laughs> I think I've evolved somewhat, but I'm still working on the piles mm. that I'm stepping in. When did you feel like you were the most wounded? Wounded. You're wounded, like internally wounded, where maybe you had you thought you had it all figured out or you thought like I'm successful, but really on the inside, maybe you felt like you were full of, you know. SHRT. Oh, well, there's been a few, but I'll say, look, Australia, the year I had there, and you know that story from the book, that was a really tough year, but that was not a year when I thought I had it figured out. Mm. That was a big year. The early questions of youth are why, 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 yes. why, why? You learn some things, you start to define your hows and whens and your wheres, and, but when I was rolling in my career later on in life and was um, like your girlfriend, Marta, yeah. uh, rolling in rom-coms uh -huh. in, 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 uh, in, in Hollywood, um, I was enjoying them, but I didn't feel like they were feeding me back. I didn't feel like they were the right kind of challenge for me. And it came to me at a time when I, I, Camilla and I had fallen in love and she was pregnant with our first son. So all of a sudden life's, Vital, man. It's like real, right? <laughs> my laughs are louder. My tears are, are wetter. My, my joy is bigger. My pain is deeper. Mm. Rom, that's not where rom-coms are built. Rom-coms are built to be buoyant up here. Keep it light. Bounce cloud to cloud. Don't go so deep mm. or so high. They're built that way on purpose. But my life was extremely getting extremely dramatic. And I liked it. And I, would, I, said, I started to feel like, well, what am I doing in my career? I mean, mm. I, mean, I remember saying this myself, am I just an entertainer? And I made sure to look myself in the mirror and go, and if you are, is there anything wrong with being just an entertainer? That's okay too. But I, I just wanted to see if my career could challenge the vitality of my life that mm. I was living at the time. Mm. So I tried to find dramas that I wanted to do that more represented the man I was becoming. <laughs> Hollywood was saying, no, thank you. You stay in your lane, McConaughey. We got other people that will do those. So I'll take, a, I'll take a massive pay cut. We said, no, thank you. Stay in your lane. So because I couldn't do what I wanted to do, I pulled up and quit doing what I was doing. And I took a one-way ticket out of Hollywood, not knowing if it would be a one-way ticket or a return ticket, but it, not knowing how long I was going to be right. dry and without work. It was it 20 months, right? Is that what 20 months without, without any work. That's unbelievable. When was the time where you felt like... Or, or when you felt like people stopped talking about you or you weren't as relevant or they stopped calling you for auditions. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So the you first- You weren't in the gossip news or whatever. Hell no, I wasn't. I mean, now remember, I'm coming from Hollywood at that time. I was living in Malibu, uh -huh. living on the beach. And my rom-com run was parlayed with paparazzi getting shots of me on the beach all the time. So McConaughey sure shirtless is, on the yeah. beach was synonymous with McConaughey and the rom-coms. It was like, his life is his rom-coms. Rom-coms is his life, right? So I moved uh, with Camilla to Texas and, we, and, and no beaches there, um, <laughs> no paparazzi there. Mm -hmm. The first six months, all I got offered was rom-coms. I said, no, 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 no. So then they said, okay, we got the message. They quit offering rom-coms. So what they offer? Nothing. Wow. I call it eight months. I hadn't heard from my agent. He says, buddy, you, you hadn't heard from me because I hadn't heard about you. I call it 10 months. He goes, man, I hadn't even heard your name in two wow. months. Wow. I call it a year. He's like, uh, buddy, I hadn't even heard your name. No one's interested. So I'm like, okay. I start thinking about, do I need to start another, find another career, another mm. vocation? No. Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. Like stop acting all in all? Well, I didn't know. I, I knew, I had already made the, the covenant with myself and my wife that I was not going back. Was I wobbly at that time? Was I looking for some, something to achieve and find some significance and purpose? Right. Thankfully, I've got a young child on the way, mm. or was probably maybe at 12 months born, just born at that time. So that's given me real resonance and purpose yeah. to keep me at least focused somewhere, focused on something I could rely on being, having meaning and value, but still I needed my own personal thing to get off to my own craft. And I, and I, and I didn't have it. Um, what was I going to do? So, you know. Freaking making wind chimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? But seriously, I was like, and I've said this before, the old bottle of my favorite spirit started looking a little bit better earlier in the day because the days were long, bro. The days were getting long. Around noon, you started one of the and Monday ones. and Saturday were melding into each other. And you know what a lifelong right. Saturdays can do to us? Make a tyrant out of us, bro. <laughs> so I was looking for... But you were on the top, man. You were like, 
I was the top uh, rom-coms. Yeah, that was my, I, I, I owned that lane. And I was the go-to rom-com guy. But I was not going to go back right. and do that. I'd made the truth that I had, that 3 a.m. truth that hit me and stuck with me for months before I made the decision to step out of Hollywood. I knew it was true. It was a quiet truth and tears had been shed on my wife's shoulder with myself going, wow. this is a decision we're making in my soul. We're going to make it and stick to it. And no matter, I think you talk about, you know, I think there was like someone offered you 15 million or somewhere around there. Right for, around months. It's testing you. 18. And it starts testing you. It's like, hell, 5 million, 10 million, 12 million. And then you said it starts to. Well, <laughs> like, I'll tell you the story. So <laughs> um, but a year goes by, nothing. And I said, I'm starting to think about different vocations, but I'm going to stick to my guns. 15 months, 18 months, another rom-com comes in. Mm -hmm. But my agent says, this one's really good, and check out this offer. Hey, offer, an $8 million offer. Let me read that. (laughs) Now, before, the first year, I wouldn't even read it. No. No to the genre. No. But I read it. It's pretty good, man. No, thank you. They come back, $10 million offer. I said, no, thank you. They come back with a $12 million offer. I said, no, <laughs> thank you. They come back with a $14.5 million offer for the same script right. that they sent first with the $8 million offer. And what did I say? Mm. Let me read this again. <laughs> and I read it again. And it was funnier. Yeah. I read it again. It was funnier. It was, I could see myself in that character. I was like, this is, could be a pretty good idea, buddy. Yeah. What you, da, 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 da. <laughs> but I ultimately said no. And when I said no to the 14.5, I think what it did is it sent an invisible sort of lightning bolt mm-hmm. through Hollywood execs mm-hmm. that McConaughey just turned down 14.5. He hasn't worked in 18 months and he wow. just turned down 14.5. What's he up to? Interesting. What's that guy doing? He's on to something. To turn that down, it shifted. It was like, he's definitely not bluffing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So one of two things could happen. Okay. Thanks for your run in Hollywood, McConaughey. See you next life. Or what did happen is two months later, I get a call for the Lincoln lawyer and mm. Killer Joe and and and, and 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 Mud and True Detective Dallas Buyers Club, all these things. And so what happened is I became I unbranded in those eight in those eight twenty months. Mm-hmm. Where is he? Now he just turned down the fourteen five. Wait, this guy is make an affirmative action. That, that, that isn't a recessive move. That's like, Hollywood. that's like, you're doing what? Right. What do you got going? So all of a sudden, I became a new good idea mm. for possibly these dramas I was looking for because I've been gone so long. Interesting. Because you didn't, I wasn't getting recorded on the beach shirtless in Mount Boo. Right. I wasn't in your theater, your home, in a rom-com each night. I was persona non grata for a while. Well, when you're gone long enough, you get forgotten or you become a new novel good idea mm-hmm. maybe for what you were looking for yeah. and that's what fortunately happened for me I love this because you talked about uh, planting gardens to attract butterflies yeah. as opposed to chasing them you also talk about this idea of being the target versus the target draws the arrow yes yeah so is that kind of what you were doing it's like you were you were, you know, tending to your own garden, your own inner world. You're developing yeah, yourself, yeah. shedding the old skin and becoming a new during that time and allowing the right things to come to you. Well, I was definitely doing the first, but I couldn't rely on the second. <laughs> okay. I was definitely tending my own garden. How do, how do we learn to have that trust and the faith that there might be something great coming to us when we draw a right. line in the sand and we say we're not going back to this personality we had, these habits, these behaviors, this industry that we were in that served us so well yeah. for so long. Yeah. But now I'm saying no to that old way of being and trusting mm. that something greater is going to wash over me. How do we trust? Because it could have not question. happened for you. It, it could, could not have... happen. We might not be sitting here right now. I might not have gone on to do the work that I've been doing since then. I might not have had the courage to go write the book. I might, I might be that high school football coach that I was thinking about being. Really? Yeah, I might be that wildlife guide in Africa that I was thinking about being. I might be that conductor of a symphony that I was thinking about becoming and not sitting here. How do we trust it? I think, look, to, when the decision came to me, it came, I, was, I was in a position to hear the truth. I was, I was in, I was in a, 
my, my heart was looking and my mind were looking yeah. and I was giving myself room to cut out all the outside stimulus. Yes. And you know how when those truths come, they land like a lightning bolt and a butterfly at the same time. <laughs> but you know they're true and they're true for you when they land. And you go, oh, that was a direct line. Whether you're religious or you call it the prime mover, the way maker, the universe, whatever you want to call it. That was a direct line and that, that's true to me. And then comes the hard part. Trust in that truth when the sun rises and you're back in the middle of the masses. Then they're all going, hey, try this. What are you doing? They, they, they weren't there for that truth last night. Mm -hmm. Their truth that they think of you was the same one you had the day before. But now your truth is different. Mm. So trust in that and not letting your onion get peeled because that's what happens. It starts to strip away. You know, it, it's, 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 it's why I think why people have, you know, church once a week. Because you're good on Monday, but come Friday, you don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You start to forget the things, uh -huh. you know. Um, that's why we need to update, to maintain ourselves with our mental health, spiritual health, and physical health. And understanding it is one thing, but then keep it in action and trusting in it. Uh, and having the patience to trust in it's another. So... It hit me in a clear way that I knew it was true. I had someone in my life, Camilla, that was close to me that I could share it and understood it and understood in the way that I shared it with her. She was like, okay, I hear you. You're not negotiating. You're not asking me a question. <laughs> You're sharing with me mm. the truth for you so I can be by your side. She didn't say this, so I can be by your side wow. and make sure you stick to it because I know how important this is to you. What was that truth that you heard or that came to you at that time? That I needed to do something different more i needed more to fulfill me mm. at that point that while i was happy that i was getting off so much to the vitality in my real life more so than my work i even looked in the mirror and said well if it's got to be one way or the other congratulations because a lot of times i've had the times where you're getting off to your work more than your real life right right but i was like I believe my work can challenge the vitality of mm. mine. I hope that my life is more vital than my work for as long as possible. Please. I hope, I hope it is. But I think I can get my work to challenge the vitality mm -hmm. and make me sweat my boots in the right way, in the same way that my life is, yeah. to give me the joy and the pain and all that the way my life is. And so I was like, well, we'll bet on it. And, don't, and make it non-negotiable. Make one bet and stick to it. Wow. And you know, it's, sometimes it, it's endurance. So trust in that. I was never, I never questioned going back on my decision. No matter, no matter I, how much money. No, no. 20 no, million, no, no, 30 no. million, 100 million. You were like, it's just not worth it. No. Because as the number, trust me, when that number went from 8 to 10, 12 to 14.5, I started getting a little. Ooh, maybe I got a little. I was like, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> you want me It didn't yeah. go from 8 to 6 to 4 to 2. Right. It went up. It went up. And I was like, okay. I got, I'm getting leverage in this. Mm. And I realized when I turned on the 14.5, I said, I got a sneaky suspicion this may give me a little leverage mm. because that's a big number. And that's, for, you know, there's a small community of the agents and the managers and the directors in Hollywood, and everyone's got to hear that you turned this down. I was sure hoping so. <laughs> and I believe they did. Right. Now, Hollywood could come tell me how much my hypothesis on that is true. But I've heard from quite a few whispers like, no, when you turn that down, that was, people went, double took and went, he did what? Right. right. Which, I don't know, made me more attractive in a new way. Mm -hmm. You know, or made you, you know, when someone does that and you go like, oh, they got their own thing going. They mm -hmm. didn't just remove themselves and sitting out there wandering in the desert. They're on to something. I don't know what it is, but you can become more attractive. In a way, I think I became more attractive for that reason. Mm -hmm. They were like, Turn out 14.5. He's got something going on. He's got a point of view. He's doing this for a reason. He's got mm -hmm. some purpose with which he's doing this for. Now you had you had your first uh, first kid right around then or a year before yeah. then? No, right, right in there. It's about a year, little over a little less than a year into that. One of the things I respect and admire about you is yes, your career is incredible, but the fact that you you know have been in a loving, committed relationship for I don't know, 16 years. 16 years. Yeah. You've got three kids. Um, and you have found a lot of fulfillment in the richness of living, not just in making money and the career and the success and the fame. Yeah. It's one of the things I respect about you. It's one of the things me and Martha were talking about this morning, about how you, you know, you, you could have had, 
you could have been the bachelor forever. Yeah. Where do you think your life would have been in that year mm -hmm. had you not had the loving, committed relationship, child as well, mm -hmm. first child? Mm -hmm. Where do you think temptation would have led you or do you think you would have made the same decision with the sand on the ground? Or was it having a committed, conscious, mm -hmm. loving relationship and partner and teammate that allowed you to have the courage to act with that line in the sand? Well, hmm. the only reason I pause here is because I'm trying to wonder how <laughs> little of credit to give the relationship. Because I'm not going to say it's 100%, but it's up there. The relationship, having her and be now about to become a father, which was the only thing I ever wanted to be, had great resonance for me. I, one, had a relationship which gave me, just singularly with Camilla, gave me more the license and courage to fly. But now I'm going to become immortal, so to speak, with a child coming into the world. Right. It's the one thing I ever dreamed of being, become a father. That was at the top of my list since I was a kid. Now I'm like, well, this is what I'm doing. This part of life is always taking precedent before anything I did since got famous, won this or won that. My career was always in front of uh, a Hollywood career. Always. That's what I mean by J.K. J. Living. That's why Jake Just Keep Living has always been sort of a mantra. What, at the end of the day, they argue with that one. At the end of the day, that wins out. I've always wanted to have a life that I'm leaving first. And I became an actor mm -hmm. and a movie star and famous. Yeah. But not, oh, I'm an actor, movie star and famous. So now, what do I do? How do I live my life according to that? Mm -hmm. No, I, didn't, I wanted to keep those in right. order. If you didn't have that relationship at that time, what do you, what do you think would have happened? That's a good question. What would have happened? Um, do you think it would have been more tempting to take the money? And st let me just. I yeah, mean, what I mean, been? yeah, the nights would have been even longer. Uh, the, 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 I think it would have definitely got more wobbly. Mm. I would have really had to. I mean, I, I believe I could have pulled it off. I'm glad I didn't have to find out if mm. I could have pulled it off on my own. I might have, I might have run off to the monastery <laughs> and still be there <laughs> <laughs> I, I i um you know or because i had i look i had very somewhat reliable temptation from people very close to me going what's your malfunction bro? right my brothers and family were like what is your major malfunction what are you doing you own this land in the wrong, but why are you making a straight line crooked, which is the line we always use? Why are you making this complicated? Mm. Do you know how many people would dream, of dream this? to yeah. even be doing this? And so I did have that understanding, which I bring up in the book about being less impressed and more involved. I was very thankful. I was never disrespecting mm -hmm. the rom-com. I was just like, I don't know. I didn't make this up, this feeling in me. Yeah, you're in a new season. Well, a new more chapter. And I, yeah. it, there's a new chapter to come. So I don't, what would I have been doing? What would I be doing now? If I didn't have Camilla and, and she, she, we didn't have our first child on the way. I, I don't know that two, that eight, that twenty months would have felt like twenty years wow. if I if I'd have stuck with it. And would I've had the patience? Would I had the fortitude? Would I've been able to stay still in the long, lonely mm. nights Man. where I didn't feel like I had purpose, mm. where I didn't feel significant, where I didn't have a newborn child in a relationship to look at and go? Because I knew then I was like. You put time into that, you cannot go wrong. Right. I looked at my newborn child. I looked at him. I was like, you put time into this, you are in the black. Bro. Mm. You, there, there is no debit. No matter how much. You can't overdo that. Yeah. So that gave me something. If I didn't have that, mm. no, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure. 16 years you said you've been together, right? Yeah. 16 years. There's a, there's a lot of men that are driven men. I'm in LA, so I see this in LA where they... They feel like they need to be single for a long time or they need to jump from partner to partner or yeah. have multiple partners at the same time, all these different things. No judgment, no right or wrong here, but I'm curious, what have you learned about 16 years in a relationship that has taught you about how much more successful you can be in other areas of life yeah. versus single life when you were also extremely successful, but, yeah. but maybe there was something missing, you know, emotionally or spiritually. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, Piggyback on where you first started. I don't, I've got friends that are poly and mm -hmm. I've got friends that are perpetually single and uh, to see them 
when they do pull it off and still have a healthy spirit and a healthy body and a healthy mm-hmm. mind, I, I applaud it. I'm right on. I do. I have seen a lot of them have to. Oh, I got to recalibrate. Yeah. I got. You know, I got I got off. I got spread too thin. Energy everywhere. You know, a little bunch of little campfires, but no bonfires, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, you can do it. I think I think a person can do it on their own. I think a person can do it in solitude. I think a person can do it even with a relationship with just themselves. If you I think can be done, um, but when you have a relationship that you're committed to that you want to make work, that it's part of your decision. And especially when you have a child mm. that is not only you're committed to, you, is dependent on you. That goes to the top of the value system. And so career choices can go into the two hole or maybe the three hole. Mm-hmm. Now, I would argue that I got better at my career when it went to the two and three hole and wasn't in the one hole. Really? Because I didn't, and I feared this. I was like, well, I was having a family and the fact that when we had kids, my wife said, if we have kids on one condition, Matthew, when you go, we go. So my family comes with me. When she said that to me, I remember going through my mind, wait a minute, I'm an artist. I'm a lone wolf. When I go to work, I'm in my Airstream all alone. It's me and my dog, maybe, but <laughs> nobody else. And as I'm saying that in my head, this other little smarter voice comes in and goes, nod your head and say, yes, ma'am. And I said, yes, ma'am. It was the greatest decision I've ever made. Right. Because... Seeing my kids or leaving before they woke up and seeing them when I got home after work was the was a beautiful, energizing reset for me at the end of the day that mm-hmm. filled me up with real life and made me more creative Interesting. going into work the next day. To tell a child when you're doing something like True Detective and they go, what was the scene about today? And you go, I better tell a good parable because I can't tell them the real thing. It's some heavy R stuff, right? So I became a better storyteller in how I'd make it a nursery rhyme wow. or something. Um but you're living for something, for, for, for someone else and something more. And, you know, for Camille and I living for the covenant that for her and I to do what we can to, to stay together and keep promoting the, each other and ourselves in a relationship and then to have the kids. I'm living, you live for something else. And that empowered me. It made me better as an individual. Really? And when I go out the door, I have more courage mm. because I know I've got that stability at home. Wow. Where do you think you would have been if you had been in a relationship, you know, five, 10 years prior? Yeah. And it'd be 25 years as opposed to 16. Do you think you would have been better in your career or you'd made that shift sooner? Or do you feel like, you know, being, no. the, being the lone wolf, you had its time and its place? And it's I think season. it had its time and its place. I'm not arrogant enough to say, oh, if I go back and change time. Um, I mean, I've thought about that. I've, I, I, I was with and dated seriously some, some wonderful mm-hmm. women before I met Camilla. Um, I think... It wasn't the time for me and it wasn't the time for them for us to take it further, to mm-hmm. take it as far as, say, getting married or something. But, it, you know, I often wonder, what if what if it was, what if I felt like it was time mm-hmm. that early? I never did. Right. What if I did? You know, do we meet the right person sometimes, but it's just not the time for us? Interesting. Do we, do, or is it, it's, it's the, the two play, it's got to be the right person and the right time for each person. Yeah. But I, I, I no, I, I, I cannot go back, you know, going forward to mystery, looking back to science. Uh-huh. When I connect the dots, I don't dare to go back sure. and go, if I had changed sure. 10 years earlier, I'm thinking about who I was dating. <laughs> if we got married, I mean, who, who knows? I, I, I don't think, I don't think it would have been the same realization 10 years earlier. I was a different man. Yeah. I was, different. I was seeing the world differently and we'll never know, but I don't, I don't, I think it was the right time for me when this happened and my mm-hmm. single years were the right amount of time for me when I was there sure. and those relationships before that, that ultimately ended, that was the right time for them to end. So how old were you when you met your wife? We're 16, so 16 53, 40, 37. 37. So when you were 37... Before the moment you met her, yeah. which I think you met her at a bar yeah. on Sunset. Club on Sunset. Sars Club on Sunset. Club. Let's call it that morning. Um, Don't go to many clubs. <laughs> Glad I went to the club this night. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Let's call it that morning or that season right before you met her. Yeah. What was it that made you feel loved yep. then? Yep. And what is it today that makes you feel the most loved today? Okay. What does it make me feel the most loved before? Yes. Better? Right. Okay. When... 
I was spiritually strong. Mm. And look, I was, I had some relationships that were loving relationships that, or I loved the woman she loved and cared for me. Mm. And those were real. Yes. I also had a season where it was just affairs. It wasn't about love. It was lust. It's fun. Yeah. It was fun. And it was, it was healthily, it was a healthy, fun transaction. And we laughed and kept it light. And that was all it was ever going to be. And we're not even, you know, and that was okay too. Mm-hmm. Um, I am happy to say that through most, most of that, I was able to keep somewhat spiritually strong. Really? Um, How did you say? And had no, and didn't really have trouble sleeping alone in my own bed. Because I've had those times, I think we all have, if yeah. we've had this single life, where there's times where if you're, if you're rolling like that, especially if it's like affairs and flirt popping around here and there, boy, all of a sudden you end up in bed alone. You can't sleep. <laughs> and you're like, whoa. Wait a minute, now I'm the company I can't stand being with? Mm. If it's only me? That would always be a trigger for me. Like, you better bend a knee and go. Go inward. Catch your breath and go inward here. So. So what made you feel the most loved before you met her? What was it? I mean. Was it the success or the the fame? No, I chase? Was it the, you know. No, it wasn't the chasing catch i knew what that, I, I knew what that was i that that always felt like a stop and not a stay mm-hmm. to me it was a season yeah i understood it to be a season and i gave myself freedom and license to have that season as healthily yeah. as, I, as as i could um i don't think i was any more shallow right right um i didn't think oh this is all there is I did have a dream where I thought where I was 80 and 88 year old bachelor, but had a lot of children. You did? Yeah. And it wasn't a nightmare. 88 year old bachelor? And you had a lot of children. And that wasn't a nightmare. Sitting on a porch and it wasn't a nightmare. Really? And I woke up from that dream not going, yippee, that's what I'll do. (laughs) I did wake up with it going, that's possible. Mm. And as soon as I said, that's possible. I did quit looking so hard. And when I quit looking for her so hard, that's when she came. Mm. Because before that, I will say, in my thought of, I do want to find someone to fall in love with and start a family. I mean, every red light, bro. In LA. Possible, possible. <laughs> produce section. You know what I mean? Possible. Yeah. Boss. Every, you know, you just. Yoga like, class, Whole Foods. You're just you checking, like you know, everywhere. And it, it, I was looking. I was leaning in, leaning in. Mm-hmm. And, and said, well, Mac, maybe that could work. Like that script. Well, maybe that could work. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and then when I had that dream, it did. It was like, oh, on a spiritual sense, I was like, well, you might end up being a radio bachelor. And if you've got. Spiritually, if you're spiritually strong, your relationship with God's strong, you, that's that's okay. It didn't make me go, that's what I want to do. Right. But just saying right. that could be a reality for you. Let me exhale and I quit looking everywhere at every I quit looking in the produce second was like, and I what happens when you do that? You become more attractive. You allow yourself to be loved. You allow yourself to see mm-hmm. someone who actually you might love. But mainly you allow yourself to be someone that can be loved. Ooh, and you're man. not selling, you're not soliciting yourself. You're not in a rush about anything. Mm. You're going to meet somebody. You also, what you look at, you want to see how they move. How far back are the shoulders? How do they talk? What do they say in between the lines? Mm. Not what they say. What do they say in between the lines? And I remember when I saw Camilla walk across the club that night, it was the way she moved. Mm. I saw history. I saw dignity. I saw somebody that was not for sale. I saw somebody that 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 that, that didn't need... <laughs> That, that when I called her over was not happy to meet me, but wasn't over the wasn't, wasn't impressed with my vocation. And she knew who I was. Wasn't impressed with that. She was about a lot more than that. So I my eyes were open mm. to seeing what I wanted and needed. And I also was able to, in that moment, completely be myself, not oversell myself. Not undersell myself. 
did you feel like you needed to oversell yourself before then, even though you had all the success and the fame and the hits and the money? And the- I think I think when just to sped it's a sped up process, mm-hmm. you know, especially if you're like, and you know, if, you, if it's a, a more of a string of short term relationships, it's like it's not overselling. It's just like let's skip the. Let's skip a lot of the real stuff. Right, Let's right. skip a lot of the, 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 you know what I mean? I don't want to take that. Come on. We're just here. We're <laughs> laughing. We're having a good time. You know what I mean? Um, uh, and that's all, that's all we're both in this for. So, you know, um, so you speed up the process mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, so I don't know when you say, what did I love? It wasn't my fame. Did I, did I feel more, did I feel more loved if my movie did well and more people came up and was like, that was great. Sure. Uh-huh. Sure. But that was never my top source of feeling love. affirmation of feeling love. Um, did I feel less loved? If the movie bombed, or if people were like, oh, "I don't like." Sure, mm. but that was never my main thing. The the source of my lack of confidence or lack of significance. It was you know, I was spiritual, and then I always had look. I always had family at this time, being my brothers and my mom and, yeah. and stuff. There was always that um, that I knew was one hundred percent reliable. Uh, but mainly, I would say spiritual. And then your follow-up question to yes. what makes you feel more loved now? Yeah, when do you feel the most loved now? Oh, the good night group hug with my three kids mm. and my my wife mm. after we just talked about what our day was like, mm. what we're looking forward to tomorrow, and we've had a few fun disagreements. And somebody said something real honest that they didn't have the courage to say maybe a week before, and for the first time, noticed that. If they shared that, they weren't going to get in trouble. Mm. That they were just going, and to see them grow and going, you got the courage. We, me and then to feel like a dad and go, me and your mother are giving you a place to feel like you can go. We, I, I, I did like her, and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, my heart hurts because she doesn't like me. To be able to, mm. for a child to be able to say that to you, it's like okay, we're doing something right. There we go. That's a feeling of love to have an honest talk, not just about all the the happy times, but about the stuff that sucks in my kids' lives as well. And even from my wife to share it and it not be like, dun, 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 dun. Right, right. To be like, yep, yeah, we're going through this. And one thing we know is we're going through it together. Mm. That, that That's, that's beautiful. That's, cool. that's beautiful. One of the things that you talked about it, in the book in the last couple of pages was this list of goals that you wrote down. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them. Isn't that wild? Ten goals in life, 1992. 92. One of them, becoming a father. And, and number two, finding and keeping the woman for me. The woman for me. Yep. Um, and you had ten of them. I'm curious, how important is it to write down our visions, our yep. dreams, our goals in order to manifest what we want in our lives? Because this whole book is a, yeah. a journal of you writing down yep. everything. Yep. And all ten of these, you, you've accomplished all of them. And you're still accomplishing yep. and living into them. Yep. So how important is it to write down our dreams, our goals, our values in order to manifest and attract them? I think it's a lot more important than we give it credit for. Look, writing things down, it seems like this old fashioned sort of archaic thing. Yeah. Just type it. It's on a screen. Put it on Put it in a Word doc. Save it. Put it in a folder. It, it can be lost back there. To actually write it with the hand. Does is a different kind of objectivity you get because it's come out of you. You've put it down now. You're looking at it. it's outside of you. It's freed up now. It's alive. It's moving now. More so than having that goal by your bedside every night, which is can be good. But to write it down, if you're writing down true goals, they they become written in your lineage. They become mm. written in your body. Whether you know it or not, in your subconscious, they just it's a way to get it into your subconscious, to write it down. Now it's out of me, it's on a page. I'm objectifying it now. I'm looking at it. So now I'm having a dialogue where before it was just Socratic. But now I'm having a dialogue and it starts to reciprocate. Those 10 goals, I wrote those down in the top bunk in the Delt House, University of Texas, 1992. My roommate was Monty Wills. I remember the night I wrote them down. Wow. I never looked at them again. I found those in writing this book and That's found crazy. out that, oh my gosh, all 10 you actually did and, and, and four you're still doing. That's crazy. I years, never looked at them again. 30 years later, you found them. Yeah. That's crazy. 
But they all happened. They all happened. I don't think they happen if I don't write them down. I don't think. They do. So that practice of writing something down that you into, or that you want, or that you yearn for, and to add to it or subtract from it along the way if you want to, or just write it down, fold it up, tuck it away so you can find it 30 years later when you go want to share a journal or, or write something about it, like I did. Um, I don't think it happens, but then just go back and see the invisible contract I made with mm. myself. Oh my gosh, I love that. Because yeah. obviously I did. Because I mean, I those 10... People go, you've done all 10. I said, well, no, I'm in the middle. I'm still, I have to, man, I'm still maintaining for it. But yes. I have engaged. Some of them I've just done. Mm-hmm. But I have engaged, I am in full engagement with all of them. And. Well, it's an invisible contract until it becomes a, a physical written contract. Right. You know. And but it's with like, yourself. And you I guess see, yeah, it, yeah, it becomes, course. there's an invisible way it becomes subconsciously non-negotiable with yourself. And here's the interesting thing. On this, I don't, is this the exact image or is this a recreated image? No, okay. that's it. This is the photo of it. Or yeah. You signed it. Yeah. And that's what I think is actually really important because you did create a contract with self. R- right. You signed the goals at the bottom. You have 10 goals in life. 9, 1, 92. And you bottom, at the bottom, you signed it. And I think that's really important in creating a, you know, uh, this contract with self is yeah. putting your name on something that you write down from the ideas in your mind into paper yeah. so that you can actualize this yeah. in life. And I think that's what's beautiful. And, and you were like, what, 20 years old when you did this? 20, 21. And, and folks, anyone who thinks so, that sounds like, you know, Mike Tyson talking about Mike Tyson when he's himself talking to the third person. <laughs> Do it. Don't worry. Sign your stuff to yourself. You know what I mean? Write, just write to yourself and sign it. Mm. It's a great practice to mm. do. You know, you are then you are then getting a third person objective view of yourself. Mm-hmm. Where so you will have a better chance of subjectively creating those and activating those things and having them happen. One of the things in here, um, <clears throat> number seven, stay close to mom and family. I know there was a period. I think you said six or eight years where you pulled away from your yep. mom. I think you're still close with your brother, but you pulled back because she was kind of loving know, my fame, loving the me. fame, and it was making it about her <laughs> as opposed to supporting your son. Um, so that was something that kind of came and went, and you, you danced with. But you know, now it seems like you guys are you know in a great place. She's living with us four years now. She's That's 91. Amazing. And then also you had number eight win an Oscar for the best actor. How do you at 20, 21, That's, write down a goal of winning an Oscar when I think and I wasn't even acting at that time. That's nuts. You didn't even do the first movie yet? No. Why did that come in your mind? Why was that even a thought, a dream, a goal? So this is, I believe, right after I had, soon after I had called my father to say, I don't want to go to law school anymore. I want to go to film school. Mm -hmm. Now, looking back. And he said a great line back to you. He said a great line. He said, don't half-ass it. Don't half-ass it. Yeah. Which was three or whatever, four, however many words, is the best words I've ever heard Mm. from the man who I ultimately really wanted my ultimate approval from. And he didn't give me, he gave me a lot more than approval with that line. Mm. He gave me a kick in the backside, go privilege, freedom, responsibility, kick, go do it. Um, and I suppose, I know consciously, but probably subconsciously too, there's things that I've done where I wanted to let something slide and those words came on my mind. I was like, uh-uh, no way. Mm. Uh-uh, that'd be half assing it. Mm. So those words have lived with me. Um, I, I decided I want to go to film school. And I went back through these journals and I find something like that. I was like, dude, you always wanted to be an actor. Oh, uh, interesting. But like, you just wouldn't admit it. Uh. And I remember always being sheepish about someone go like, well, you just want to, want you perform? I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't. Do. Something about it in my head felt fraudulent mm. then. Something about being behind the camera to go to director school, learning story felt like, well, that's my, I'll sneak in the back door mm-hmm. to the acting, right? But that's the better way. And I, I'm, I'm glad I went that path. Mm. But I think I wanted to, and I've talked with my buddy Rob Bindler, who I bring up often in this book about it. And he was like, yeah, you were wanting to, you, he'd tell, remind me of talks we'd have late night. And he was already at NYU film school. Wow. He was like reminding me of, yeah, you were already wanting to at this time when you first went to film school. So I write that down to myself. I'm, I'm not afraid to write it down to myself, but I'm afraid to say anything like that out loud. I'm not, I'm not afraid to even say I would, I'm interested in going into acting at this point. Wow. 
But yet, I write down, I want to win an Oscar for Best Actor. <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> so when you saw this paper, you had already won yeah. these goals. You, yeah. you know, for the first time after, I guess, on close to 30 years, you'd won it, I think, I don't know, six, seven years prior to that. Yeah. Um, what did that feel like when you read this and you saw win an Oscar for Best Actor? Oh, I, just, actually, I, was, I read it. I was like, ah, are you kidding? Get out of here, Camilla! Wow. Check this out! Are you kidding me? Wow. And then I went, whoop! Right back to the night, and I remember sitting in the top bunk. We'd just come from the arcade, me and Monty Wills, my roommate. He was in the bottom bunk, I was in the top bunk. Like a two Thursday night. I've been journaling, I wrote it in this little journal, and I remember that night. Hmm. Other people were actually going out for a later, we'd been out kind of party, and other people went to the next party, and I decided to come home and sort of buy it. Oh, the top funk. I brushed my teeth, went up, put on my shorts, got in bed, got in the cover, sat up there, and had a little window right here, and I had a little diary on a little window seal with a pen. Bunk bed. Yeah. That we made. We made these bunk. We were the first bunk beds in the Dell house. And um, pulled over and I wrote it. And I think I had it. I think I even, um, a form of a headlamp. If I even had headlamps. I loved headlamps. Yeah. Still do love headlamps. Um, and I'd written that and I wrote that down. Curious, if you didn't create this contract for yourself, do you think you would have accomplished all 10 of these goals and dreams for your life? Or would some of them maybe fall through the cracks because you didn't create that, turn the invisible contract into a physical written contract and make it real? I, I don't know. I mean, I have to believe that writing them down subconsciously led to me, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, I knew what they were. Mm -hmm. I couldn't recite them to you because I never looked at them again. Mm -hmm. But I knew what they were. And it tells me I had good goals because I actually, they, they, they were true ones. I mean, we all write down goals that we go like, later on, no, you were bullying yourself. <laughs> you, were, you were just writing down what you think someone wanted you to say. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, 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 and this particular night, I, I think I obviously wrote things down that were, had real, I mean, I told my future in a way. Mm. Wow. I don't, trust me, when I write, every time I put a pen to paper, I'm not, I'm, I batted a thousand on this one. Yeah. I, I went 10 for 10. I don't, I don't go 10 for 10 all the time. Right, right, you know right. what I mean? But writing them down the right ones, if I, and even without looking at it, I don't, I, I doubt I would have pulled these things off. Mm. Um, How do we learn to listen to the true highest version of ourselves yeah. and write the right goals and, and follow that path? Yeah. As opposed to chasing the, you know, the stuff that leads to a lot of red lights. Yep. And actually create a lane of green lights yeah, 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 yeah. for us. Yeah. Obviously, you had obstacles to overcome on this journey. And that's part of the human condition. But you actualized all these. How, do we, how, did, how did you, you know, you were listening to yourself and you authentically said, become a father, find and keep the woman for me keep my relationship with God and chase my best self as your first four. Mm -hmm. You didn't say become a billionaire, you right, know, have, right, right. have 20 mansions, have three, you know, Maseratis. Or yeah, something, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is what you think a 20 year old might, I mean, that's probably what I was thinking right. when I was 20. You know, it's like, how did you think about these, you know, the first four and the sixth one, take more risks. It's like, stay close to mom and family. Then number eight was a more material thing. Win an Oscar. It yeah. wasn't win an Oscar first. Right, right. Um, we got to ask yourself what we we all. I think we can all agree we all want more. We have dreams. We have goals. We got to ask yourself first, more what? Mm. And that starts, I think, by going and answering that question. Well, what do I value the most? And so, look at the things that you already got in your holster that you value, because you don't want to be reckless with those things and cast them off and let all the weeds grow around those. And then all of a sudden you can't even recognize that garden. So if you, I think that the first things were about taking care of mm. things that I, that I value. They were very personal. They were take care of myself. They were take yeah. care of my mom, take care of the family, take care of my relationship with God. They were very, very, very personal things to me that I knew and believed would be lifelong mm. maintenance journeys. And that, Things that I believed at that time that 
No, taking care of those is never going to go out of style for you, bud. Pick out the things that are not, not, not the fads, because we'll write things down. Those three Maseratis, yeah. hey, man, you get 20 years from now, you may not like Maseratis. You might like a Bugatti. You know what I mean? So don't write Maserati. You know what I mean? Watch out what proper nouns we're using, because hey, some of them may be just fickle. You know what I mean? So those the proper nouns, family, God, myself, Chase, mm-hmm. so those are things that I gave value to and gave me value and meaning in my life. And so I was like, I, I was already in the, I was already in the midst of those. And those are things I said, I'm not going to forgive these. And I'm not going to, no matter who I become, I'm not going to say, oh, these are no longer on my plate. I don't need to worry about these. Like you said, the Oscar, that's a new one. That's something that was out there. That's big. Um, becoming a father, that's out there. But... I, I, since I was eight years old, the one thing I knew I wanted to be was a father. Wow. Um, I knew I wanted to meet the right person, the right woman for me. Didn't have her. Mm. Hadn't met her yet at that point. It's far from it. Um, so start with the things that we got in our saddle that you do already give you about, that already give you meaning and value in your life and double down on those. Project forward. And if that happens what will what will what what are what i dream of it to become and then if you're going to talk about i think when we're talking about a, a career we got to ask ourselves first i think this would be really valuable for everyone to ask yourself first what do you have an innate ability for an innate talent for and what are you willing Is that the same thing you're willing to work your ass off for? And then thirdly, which is a little bit more of an asterisk, is that something that the world would demand? Mm -hmm. If we're going to go straight capitalism, Mm -hmm. supply and demand. Mm -hmm. But we often look at things, and I've done it. I'll bust my hump for it, but I'm like, I'm really not that good at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Or I've got something that sometimes we have things that we're really good at. We're like, I just, but I, I kind of just a natural. I don't want to work at it. Mm-hmm. If you can find something that you have an innate ability for, and we love doing things we have an innate ability for, right? We have an yeah. innate talent it's in our DNA for, and then go, now I'm ready to educate myself, learn, hustle, go after, see, create opportunities. Bam, bam. Mm-hmm. It's going to be in the prism of my, how I measure every situation where I am going forward. Hunt it down and do what you got to do to get better at it. And then if it's hopefully something that the world could demand, you're... Well, that's a sweet spot. Now you're, now, now, you're, now you're paying your rent, man. <laughs> now, 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 now we got food on the table. Now, 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 now we're rolling. Now we're waking up with some purpose. Now we're uh-huh. waking up with, um, you know, yeah, it's going to be a hard day today, but I don't, I can't, I'm not dreading Monday morning, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, May want to sleep in, but I got. I'm building something. I'm sure. building something here. I'm in construction. Mm-hmm. One of the things that you, uh, I want to connect that to this thought here. Six twenty two, Matthew six twenty two. If thine eye be single, the whole body will be full of light. Yep. I believe that's your favorite passage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you went on a journey. You know, after the it was either in the middle or at the end, of, tail end of your rom com. You know, stardom, and you went to on a trip. You went on a journey. With yourself, yeah, I think for 28, 22 days, 22 days, uh, in the Amazon, yeah. And there was a moment in the book where you talk about essentially you had to kind of have a coming to you know moment with yourself where you had to shed all the yeah. identities that you were holding on to your rings, your heritage, your background, your clothes, your I'm, the, I'm famous, I'm a rom com guy, I'm an actor, I'm a, you had to shed all of it, yep. And what was the thing that you found when you let go of your identity in the outer world? That I was a mammal. <laughs> <laughs> a mammal. And for me, as a believer, a child of God. Uh-huh. That's it. <laughs> uh, baseline. <laughs> and the mammal we can all agree on, right? The child of God, that was for me and any other believers. But... The b- baseline. It. I got okay. rid of, I remember my dad's ring, which yeah. had an M on it, gold melted down from their, my mom and dad's class rings and gold from my mom's teeth. It meant a lot to me. Yeah. But it was an identity marker. I'm a McConaughey. This is about my dad. I had my American cap that I'd worn for two decades. I'm an American. Let me get rid of that. Got rid of all these little talismans that were identities and, and titles yeah. that meant something. 
They weren't random. They were healthy ones. Yeah. But I stripped them all off. And it was like, bull. And no, you're not famous. And no, it's not. A, you were what before you were ever an actor. Before, what are you? What were you? Before you were McConaughey. Before you were Texan. Before you were an American. Before you were an actor. Before you were a movie star. Before you were a celebrity. What? What? Come on, get it all off. And I. And it was a purge, mm. basically. And I ended up. That was there. Was a. I was a naked, sweating mammal. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was like you're a man with a child of God uh-huh. and that's what you are so mm. we've stripped off all the accoutrements we've stripped off the ornaments here we are and that is the night that I was like this happened a couple of times in my life and I think this is important for us all to do so at some point that's when I was like okay and what other truth do we know McConaughey mm. Tell you what, another truth I've been realizing right now is that you're the only son of a can't get rid of. Mm. So we're going to duke it out for the rest of our life here, or are we going to figure out how to get along? Wow. What are we going to forgive right now, and what are we going to say the buck stops here? No more, I'm not putting up with it, because I'm tired of playing grab with yourself. I'm going to cut the shit, man. Let's get along. I can't get rid of you. Everybody else, every other relationship out there's a choice. You're the one person I don't have a choice to hang out with. So let's work this out. And just like going back and saying the embarrassment and shame turned into giggles, I began to go like, man, maybe you're being too hard on yourself on this thing. You know what? Get that monkey off your back. You're human, man. Forgive mm-hmm. yourself. And these other things, dude, you've been a repeat offender. It hadn't been paying you back. Mm. You've been regretting that choice every time you make it and you keep freaking making it. Cut the man. Evolve. Turn the page. No more. And next morning, I remember even the, the Sherpas and stuff in Peru. I came out of the tent and they all started going, La Luz! La Luz! Light. The light. Mm. The light. And they were talking about me and the way I was moving. Interesting. And I went for a walk. And for the first time during that trip, I didn't give a damn more about what was around the, about what was around the next corner. You weren't thinking about the destination. I wasn't thinking about the destination of getting to the Amazon and how it's been 11 days. When are we going to get there? And mind you, this 11 days prior, I had not really been present in the trip because I was thinking about the result, getting to the destination so much. And then this morning, after that night, I'm walking. I'm not even thinking about what's around the next corner. And when I did turn the corner, I was stopped by this sea of atomic, plugged-in neon blue, like a puddle, like a bubbling puddle in the middle of my jungle path. And it stopped me. And I looked at it. I've never seen colors this, mm. this neon and bright. It was like it was not man-made. It was glowing. I'm completely sober this time. No, I lost no peyote. Not. This is straight eyed, right? And it stopped me. And as I stared at it for about 30 seconds, all of a sudden it started to flutter and rise and dissipated. It was tens of thousands of these Amazonian butterflies. Wow. And I stayed there for a minute. And then this little word, words came into my brain from the prime mover that said, all I want is what I can see and what I can see is in front of me. Mm. I was free. I was light. It was magical. I walked, I turned the corner, went down the trail and there was the Amazon. I finally made it. I made it to the river right after that moment. Wow. Did not know if I was still days away, weeks away, what? Now, stuff like that happens, we got to listen. Yeah. Those are some of those truths that come that you go, nobody else was here to witness that. Mm. That was not for the whole class. That was not on the speaker. That was not on the bulletin. That was not on the nightly news. That was not even at church on Sunday with the congregation. That wasn't at school. That wasn't sitting around the dinner table with mom and dad learning lessons. It wasn't from a mentor. That was for me mm. in this moment. 
I must heed that truth. You've been on this journey of a lot of people seeing you on screen and your personalities on screen and your talent in characters. But now over the last three to four years, you've been revealing yourself more and more through your book, mm. through all of your amazing content online, all the interviews you've been doing and all the, the solo content, which I think is amazing. Please keep doing that. Oh, um, good. Thank you. I think it's amazing, these lessons that you share. Um, but you're doing something coming up with a couple of buddies of mine, uh, Dean Graziosi and Tony Robbins, where you're creating a, a live virtual event yeah. called The Art of Living, L-I-V-I-N. And we'll have all the information linked up below so you guys can just click on a link and get there and get registered. But if you guys go to lhliving.com, it'll take you right to this event. It's a free event, yeah. full, I think about a half day. You, Tony Robbins, Dean Graciosi, Trent Shelton, Marie Forleo are, are putting on this experience. Yeah. And I really call it an experience. I've watched some of the videos you guys have made behind the scenes. It's going to be incredible. So if you are listening, watching, or seeing a clip of this right now, run to lhliving.com. Sign up. It's 100% free. Yep. And you're going to be sharing a lot of wisdom and truth and, and lessons that you haven't shared in here and expanding upon it and new yeah. stories. You're going to be expanding a lot on this where, you know, Dean and Tony came to me and said, look, we, we love green lights. And as, as I wrote in the book, it's an approach to life book. And they said, would you be interested in getting into the process? Like making it even, uh, making it tangible tools for people to use that they can measure in circumstances. I was like, yes. Yeah, so that's what we've been doing. That's what we're going to get into the hood mm -hmm. of on the 24th it's been amazing. is how to make it something transformational, hopefully for you individually where you can see, oh, this is how I can utilize this in my life. Yes. You know, I talk about the green lights, yellow lights, and red lights, and the approach to them in there. That's the biggest question I've been asked since I put the book out. Yeah. Well, the green lights. I'm in the left lane. How do I trust this is a, this is this is as good as it's supposed to be? Is this the right truth for me? Um, red lights. I can't stand it. What do you mean there's a gift in the red light? How's there a gift in the freaking red light? There is. Mm. Yellow light. How do I, the one where I got to make a choice to either slow down or put the pedal to the metal. What do I do? It's coming up. I feel it. I don't know what I do. Do I call an audible? Like, tell me to make the choice. All of explaining those things, we're going to explain a lot of the science to satisfaction, which will lead to the art of living. And the art is individual. The science is something we can each use and utilize and share, but the art will be yours individually for how you can use it and this and make it through this this dance called life we're all in yeah i'm so excited i'm excited to attend myself and be there and if you are feeling stuck or if you feel like you're on the sidelines if you feel like you've got a really good life but you know there's something greater yeah. or if you feel like you're just moving and grooving and, and life is happening and it's all manifesting and attracting in, in a beautiful way this is for people who are in every situation in their yeah. life to keep on track if they're already moving and grooving, yep. if they're at a good life, but they're not getting to that greatness that they want, it's for them. And it's also for people that are stuck or feeling like they're on the sidelines. So yep. make sure you sign up. It's going to be an amazing free virtual event. You can watch it on your phone, at home, on the TV, anywhere it is. It's free. Sign up, lhliving.com. And we'll link all that up as well. You know, the last story you just told, you know, had the entire room just like in awe and in shock and just silent here as you were talking about this truth that you realized from within, essentially. You came mm -hmm. through God and you realized from within. No one was around you. And I, and I mentioned this quote before that, if thine eye be single, thy whole body will be full of light. Right. Matthew 6, 22. What does that mean to you? If thine eye be single, yeah. thy whole body, body will, will be, be full, full of light. And that light came to you in that moment. Yeah. And these Sherpas were saying, you know, la, la luz, la luz. You were radiating yeah. light yeah. after this came to yeah. you. Why is this your favorite passage? Oh. And and what does it mean for you? And how can we start to step into that? So the mandorla, this is what the mandorla is. So we 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 see we're we so often are seeing life in contradictions, right? Future, the past, heaven, hell, technology, culture, and we see them as contradictions. And when in truth, that's, that's two eyes, right? And there's mm. judgment on either side. And there's a duality there. But the truth mm. is in that third eye. Interesting. Where they overlap. 
And that's not a shade. So we go, oh, that's a shade of gray. No, it's not a shade of gray. What the verse is saying, what I get from it is that's where all the colors live. Mm. All the colors of the truth live. That passage, when I always tell myself, keep a high eye. It's, keep the high eye. It's third eye. It shows up in all the religions too. Yes. It shows up everywhere. Um, it, it, it's, it's a way of perceiving the, the truth, I think, which lives in the paradox. And paradox is a word that some people go, oh, don't get into paradox. That's too, I don't know, academic or whatever. No, paradox is where it's, it's both are true. Two things can be true at the same time. It's today we could utilize it. It's like if I seek to understand you and where you're coming from first, I'm probably going to, before I under, seek to be understood, mm-hmm. we don't usually, it has to do with listening, has to do with how we see things it's how it's it's how we judge um we it's very easy and especially today i think we love to be judge and jury on others and ourselves and it's a very arrogant thing for us to do and this passage if that i be single mm. and not a dual contradiction and seeing the contradiction of things have gone oh this is true and that's true and instead of or right there's that's where the truth lives i believe um and it doesn't mean that you just straddle the fence and you're non-committal about anything. Right. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean you're you're, you're just Mister in between. So that's true and that's true and it's all okay. No, you can then have judgment, but see both first. See the overlap of the truth and understand it from both sides, and then be understood. And you can then have judgment, but see it through that lens first. Yeah. Because we just don't do it. We come in with one eye, or we me us versus them. Me versus you. My idea versus yours. Left versus right. Democrat versus Republican. Even, how far can you go? Can you go down to right versus wrong, good versus bad? I mean, we, we see them as contradictions and they're, and, and they're not. We, we all know. We all got a little good in us. We all got a little bad in us. <laughs> it's a choice we make where we then have judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that passage has... Uh, Elevated my POV mm. quite a bit. And, after, and it, it's one that I daily remind myself really? of. Um, if I'm getting a low eye on somebody, if I'm condescending people, if I'm objectifying people, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <whistles> High eye, buddy. Mm. Come on. Open that third eye. You're not, it's, not, it's not open. My kids can see it in my eyes when I'm talking to them. Yeah. If I'm talking at them or if I stop and really look at them and maybe there's something, maybe it's a, it's a form of discipline. But then they can see if I'm looking at them like, I love you, man. This is why I'm trying to teach you this. All of a sudden they go, my son said it. I see you there. I have to buy. Really? 622. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. He's like, I heard you. I didn't hear you before when you were talking just at me. You know? So it's a great, it's, it's, it's a great reminder. Matthew yeah. 622. I think it's the good. whole body will be full of light mm-hmm. and you will move lightly and with discernment. Does it take away discernment? Does right. it take away judgment? Just yeah. saying, see it through that lens first and understand mm-hmm. that that truth is where those overlap. Yeah. And then make your decision. Wow. I think it's beautiful that your, I believe it was your son that was born at 622. 622. That's crazy, man. So there's another one. I'm all about the, <laughs> I'm all about the, the symbols and the signs and the synchronicities of life. And me and my girlfriend, Marta, we, we talk about how, how impactful it is to listen and, and watch for the signals and signs yeah. and synchronicities. And, you know, and I think you would probably say that that might be a green light that you should be looking towards when you see those things kind of coming in your peripheral. I think so. But let's talk about this because I was writing this yesterday. It seems our greatest strength is our greatest Achilles heel. Mm. And if you overcompensate for something that works for you, mm-hmm. all of a sudden you go into the equal and same amount into the debit section. Meaning, on this instance, if you're, we've all been there. If you're looking for the signal and the significance in every situation, uh-huh. you start creating ones that aren't real. <laughs> Making them up. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, brrr, Wow, you're getting stimulus from everywhere. Oh, that was a sign. Oh, that was a sign. Oh, and I remember writing this line about everything has significance, but not everything is significant. Mm. 
right? And so we have to watch that fine line of where do we intuit? Where do we feel a truth? But if we're, again, like find, like we were talking earlier about finding, can remember when I quit looking for? If we're hunting for the significance in every single thing, it could be mental meditation. Uh-huh. We can, the subplots become unmanageable. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? How do we know when it's significant? R- right. Put our, can we put ourselves in that place to receive it? Uh-huh. And be aware be to see it. You got to be light. You got to be light. And you got to be in a place where you can hear it, feel it, and see it. But if we're out there going, well, you know, we've all been there. Look at that art. Wow. That <laughs> tree. You know, and all of a sudden you look up three hours later and you, you, you were on your way to the bathroom, but you didn't move six inches because you were so, <laughs> oh, wow, wow. And that's, we've been around those people like, whoa, subplots are a little unmanageable, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, at the same time, you got to be open to that, mm-hmm. that mystical math that comes to us because mm-hmm. there's a metric to that there mystical is. math. There's a metric to that spiritual those gifts that come to us. We don't know how to put them in a category and go, there's how they're currency. There's the credits and debits. Uh-huh. There's how they bring us ROI. And this is what they're worth. They don't come in numbers like that. But there is a real, true, valuable metric to them. And I think, again, art of living, how are you aware to them, aware of them, and be open to them, and put yourself in a place so you can receive them. At the same time, not go hunting them down in every single right. shape, every size, day. and smell. Because <laughs> then you'll be just, you'll just spin in circles, you yeah. know? Yeah. And it's, that's an art, you know? And, mm-hmm. and, and I don't know how to explain what that art is. I've got times where I feel like I'm in the, people call it maybe the flow state, where uh-huh. you're kind of, intuition's right on time, man. Yeah. I don't know what time it is. I don't even wear a watch, but I was right on time again, wasn't I? Uh, whatever that is, you know? Your reactions, you, 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 understand what someone's saying even if it's not what they're saying you kind of come back you see where they're coming from you're, you're taking care of yourself but you're taking care of others at the same time it's a wonderful yeah. flow wow um and it starts i think a lot a baseline for that would be to be in that position to see those mystical sort of uh gifts that come it starts with gratitude yes i love in your acceptance speech one of the first thing you said was it's a scientific fact that gratitude reciprocates. Pays back. I love that you said that in your speech, by the way. Thank uh, you for putting that out yeah. in the world because I feel like gratitude is the path, it's the doorway that opens to the pathway of abundance, yep. of love. Of, Come, coming in and going out. Yes. It, it, to light, all these different yeah. things. And so it's the, the magnifier and the magnet yeah. to what you want in a conscious, healthy way. You could also magnify it in other unconscious, unhealthy ways, but I think that's what it does. So I'm so grateful that you said that Uh, on a big platform, a big stage, because I feel like when people see someone accomplish a big thing, a big award or a big, you know, fame or success, they want that. But I'm glad you fed people the peas and carrots right right away and talked about gratitude. It's gratitude. It's gratitude. It's a scientific fact. When did you realize that gratitude was the key for you in, in opening up so many doors? My mom was big on, on gratitude. And I mean, she instilled it in us at an early age. I remember it was, you know, you get up grumpy in the morning, you come into the kitchen from your bedroom for breakfast and you wanted to sleep longer and you're kind of grumpy. <laughs> and she'd see it the way we would walk. And if we were kind of, uh, she'd turn around from the kitchen, make a breakfast. She goes, go back to your bed. And don't get out of bed until you're ready to come in here and see the rose in the vase instead of the dust in the table. And you'd be like, oh, geez, okay, yeah, I gotta go back. I rearranged. And she would preach just the very baseline basics. Like, you, who do you think you are to think you were guaranteed the sun was gonna rise for you today? Mm. Jeez, mom. I remember, mom, I got this old pair of snotty sneakers with holes in them and stuff. I need another pair of sneakers. Oh, yeah, you think another pair of sneakers? Let me introduce you to the kid with no feet. Oh, geez, mom. You see, always like baseline sober to sup on stuff like that, <laughs> right? So it started with the very baseline stuff. Now, we get more fluent in life. We have things. I don't think we should take even those things for granted. Yeah. But a lot of us are out there going, okay, I get that part, but how do we become thankful for, you know, more things we have around us in our life? Um, I think that, the more we are 
give thanks for. It's, it's, we give more value to that thing or that person or that place or that instance. You give more value to it, it means more to us. If something means more to us, we tend it. We take care of it. When you take care of something, something grows. So it scales. So actually gratitude is the root of generosity. Coming in and going. And it's a self-serving thing. It's not just a self-less serving. It is self-serving. I applaud that it is. And if you're going to give gratitude out for selfish reasons, I say, bravo. (laughs) You know, because it will reciprocate the same way back out. Um, It just, it, 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 you know, in our foundation, we have these young kids that we give them a safe place to go after school. They learn nutrition, uh, they make a physical goal, and they do community service. These are Title I schools. And at the end of every one of those classes, they opt to sit around in a, in a circle and share something out loud they're thankful for. And these are high school students. It ain't cool to say thank no. you for stuff in an high school, right? Well, when they first started saying thank you, they were going like, I'm, I'm thankful for the Just Good Living Foundation. I'm thankful. And they all repeat themselves. They're like, no, sure. no, 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 guys. Y'all, y'all are thinking, Personal, y'all feeling like this good. is too serious. So one day it got to me and I was like, I'm thankful I got up and got a kiss from my wife this morning before I got out of bed. And they all started hooting and hollering. Ooh. And I was like, see, you can be thankful for fun stuff too. So they all started saying thankful. I'm thankful Halloween's coming. I'm thankful I got, I'm, I'm looking so sharp. that And one laughed. Yeah. But what that led to was then people started to feel free to go. I'm thankful my mom is out of the hospital. Mm. I'm thankful my sister got into that college. I'm thankful my dad got a job. And when we asked them, what's your favorite thing about the gratitude circle? This is the coolest answer. They started coming up to us and saying, well, my favorite thing about it is that I'm for the first time hearing peers of mine say, thank you for something in their lives that I have in mind that I've always taken for granted. There's that reciprocity again. Where do you think you would be if you had zero gratitude in your life? Oh, geez. Zero gratitude in life. If you never expressed it, if you never experienced it, if you never talked about what you're grateful for. I'd look, think- a, I'd look a lot older. I'd feel a lot older. I'd have less energy. I'd, I'd, I'd be a cynic, which is a great disease of getting older that we all should stave off. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, you wouldn't want to be hanging out with me, man. I don't know. No, no. You wouldn't. I mean, I, 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 I'd probably be right. About a lot of things. Righteous, yeah. And you'd be like, good for him. I don't want to be around this. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, yeah. Do you think we can manifest abundance and the things we want, the goals we want without gratitude? Is it possible? Yeah. you. I mean, you could mathematically compound mm-hmm. things that are technically good or should mm-hmm. should come in abundance, I think. But you're not going to enjoy it. <laughs> right, right, right. That inner abundance won't be there. It'll be a, a little antiseptic. Right. It'll be all treble, no bass. It won't have much, mm. won't have any feeling <laughs> to it. I don't think you're going to be, why, why cheat yourself out mm-hmm. on the, on the, on the, yeah. the great, feeling of being thankful for something Mm -hmm. it's 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 there to be thankful for yeah and again i don't mean when i bring up earlier be less impressed more involved i don't mean i don't mean that by oh disrespect don't be because we have to be more than just happy to be here we can't just all run around going just so great i'm what i just so happy to be alive we got we want to be more than that I mean, again, have some discernment, make a choice, have some identity, define what you want more of and you want more value of in your life and set goals and go after things, create things. So we have to be more than just happy to be here. Yes. But that doesn't mean that if we are ambitious, that we quit respecting and giving gratitude for the fact that I'm happy I'm here. I respect this situation. I respect the, 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 the position I'm in, the, the, this table to talk to you, that we're here to talk, that everyone here that set up the camera, that we're able to do this. I'm not in jail right now. There's a whole list of long yeah. things I'm happy I'm not, you know? Um, 
we can, we can that that's never that never goes out of style to go go underneath where we are to to, to lesser harder situations and just realize this is cool. Yeah. This is cool to be here. So what so when we when we do that, we're gonna give more again, more meaning to this, more uh, more value to it. I'm gonna be more generous. I'm gonna it's gonna it's gonna work not only for me, it's gonna work better for you. It's gonna work better for you. Yes. It's gonna work for all. It's a it's a it's a it's the kind of epidemic we want. It's a it's a win win win. Yeah. It's a win for us, it's a win for others and the world. Gratitude epidemic is not being a, a delusional optimist. Right. And I, no, don't don't be a fool. You know, I'm not running around going, no, nothing's ever hard. Everything's always great. No, it's not. You know, no, no, I'm always happy. No, you're not. Maybe you're not digging deep enough because you're always happy. Are you really chasing the things that have meaning in your life? Because things that have meaning take maintenance. Right. They break down. Right. It hurts. It sucks. We get bruised. We try to tickle, but we end up pinching. It doesn't always come and end going. It doesn't always, doesn't always work. It takes maintenance. What's the thing you struggle with the most in your life right now? After all this success outwardly, yeah. all the... The, it's what seems like a lot of love, a lot of inner peace, a lot of family, community, connection, service impact now, greater than just your talent and your on-screen, yeah. but also changing lives and touching people emotionally and spiritually with your, your message. What is your biggest struggle at this season of life? Am I doing enough and is what I'm doing? Am I doing it the right way? Mm. The best way? Um. I, I, I need accomplishment mm -hmm. for significance. Interesting. I wish it didn't as much. At the same time, like, I'm glad you do need that. If you didn't have that, again, like the times I was talking earlier, being arrogant put me in situations to get humbled. Sure, sure, sure. You know sure. what I mean? If I, if I didn't want accomplishment, I was like, well, okay, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But I, but I, 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 I you know, I say this, um, we talk about it. Midlife crisis is, oh. and then I heard there's this thing called quarter life crisis. Oh. Now, I mean, okay, we're gonna 10, 10 year old crisis, whatever, whatever these crises are. The, 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 the original one, which was kind of titled the midlife crisis, right? I think one, bravo, way to go. You're, you're, you're turning the page, you're wanting to do more, you're wanting to find more, something different. Bravo, way to make it hard on yourself at the right way, at, at the right time after you. Usually have already accomplished quite a bit. But don't forget this. Let's go back to gratitude. And this is where a lot of people, I think, get hung up in the midlife crisis. Wanting to do more and something different is great. But not at the expense of disrespecting what you've already done. Right. Not discounting what you've done. No. Before. And too many of us discount. Oh, I've done nothing. Oh, that's not worth anything. Oh, what's the stuff I built? Uh. And when usually, no, that is something. No, that is something. And when I say give yourself credit for that, that doesn't mean trust that you're not going to go, oh, okay then, I'm, I actually don't want to do more new stuff. I'm cool. It's not like you're going to go just retire and go to the beach or play golf or quit doing anything, but it doesn't cancel that at your ambitions out. But we need to be more, give more respect to what we've already built. And then we'll take on our midlife crisis, which I'm going to return that something. <laughs> crisis, I don't like the word crisis on that, but you're still... Ambitious. You can be ambitious and have an entrepreneur spirit to want to go change things in your life while still respecting. I think you actually think you'll find more and do more of what you want to do the, the best way for yourself when you do have a respect and a connection to your lineage of what you actually have built and to cred give yourself credit for what you have built to this point. Yeah, yeah. So not cancel that out. So I need to feel like I'm barren to go forward. No, that's going to help you. Mm. Stay, that, this next story is connected to that one. Sure. All right, not, it's not a new book. It's the same book. It's just a new chapter we're looking for, right? Wow. Those stories are connected. It's the same hardcover. We don't start over in our lives and start a new book. Mm. Start a new chapter, maybe. And those things that we like to tell ourselves, oh, it's a new chapter. They're usually just commas. <laughs> those things that we like to say, <laughs> oh, it's the end of the book. It's usually just a period at the end of the paragraph. Mm. And those things we go, no, it's a whole new uh, uh, means of communicating. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new encyclopedia. No, it's just a new chapter yeah. in the same book. We all only get 
one book. Right. Before I ask these final questions, I want people to go to lhlivin.com. That's L-I-V-I-N.com. We'll have it linked up in the description, whether you're watching um, or listening. We'll have it linked up. So wherever you're watching or listening, make sure you go there. Sign up for this free virtual live event. Uh, make sure you check it out. You're not going to want to miss this. It's going to be, there's probably going to be a million people that are signed up for this thing. When I talked to Dean, he was like, this is going to be a million people at least. So I think it's going to be a ton of people. There's going to be a massive community of people that are all looking for more and looking to understand more within themselves. So make sure you guys sign up for that right now. You'll get notified by it. You give your email and you'll be in there. I've got three, five. I wish I could go another two hours, but I will have to do another one okay. with your next book. Um, but I've got three final questions for you. Um, this first one is about significance because we mentioned significance and everything has significance, but not everything is significant. Yeah. I think is what you said. I, I'm going to butcher this, but it's something like 20 years ago, one of the, the things that most kids grew up wanting to be was like a, an astronaut. Now it's the number one thing is a YouTuber or like an influencer. Yep. And it just seems like the, the youth wants fame and success yep. and influence yep. more than ever before. And essentially wanting significance, right? Wanting to be significant and significance. Yeah. What is your thoughts on fame? You know, having been famous for a long time now and experienced probably the, the, the juice of it, the pleasures of it, and mm -hmm. also some of the stuff that's not so nice. Sure. What is your thoughts on fame that you want people to know whether in their youth or at any stage of life on what it is, what it isn't, and how to manage it when you got sure. it. Sure. Fame. Before you go, I want to be famous, which is a great ambition. It's fun. I'm famous. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. It's, it's the access. It's given me. It's, been, it's, 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 it's definitely in the black in my life. It comes with its harder and short challenging things like loss of anonymity. I don't meet strangers anymore. Um, I do something, say something, it's out there. I can feel the energy of the world, whether it's pro or con, how they, what they think about it, whether it's true or whether it's not, whether it's complete or whether it's valid. Um, but don't say, before you say I want to be famous, that's fine, table that, scoot that over. Mm -hmm. For what? Mm. We all want to be relevant. I do. You? Mm -hmm. You better damn sure ask yourself, relevant for what? What do you want to do really well? What do you want to do? Do you have an innate ability for that you're willing to work for that maybe you can become an expert on? Or maybe you can, maybe you're just really good at winging it. But what do you want to do that, 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 could give you fame, but fame without without a um, an understanding of a structure of a, of a of a competence of a skill. In my experience, is is a, is a, is a real sort of vapid mirage of a moving target mm -hmm. because there's you know the old word fifteen minutes of fame. There are fads that come in and out all the time that are very seasonal. We could do whoosh, heat seek and chase them. And we do all the time. I got nothing against that. But understand that that may not be lasting. And, and, and when you are going to do something that you think, oh, this is going to get me more likes or give me some fame, just check in with yourself and go, well, if that goes out of fashion, or if in 20, 10 years, as far as you can project, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, Am I going to still feel like I will stand by that? Mm. Just, 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 just measure yourself. Give yourself a little projection before you go, because we can do stuff right now to get famous that we will absolutely regret tomorrow. But tonight we're gonna be famous, <laughs> baby. <laughs> Have a little sense of delayed gratification and project forward mm -hmm. of what the possible consequences of what you're doing to get attention and fame oh, will, will be. And bet on yourself. Just bet on yourself because the best way, if we can, is to build something and be competent at something where it's a, even if it goes out of style, it will be looked back or let, 
going, nope, that person did that really well. Mm -hmm. That's what they were known for. Right. And even though we don't do that anymore, things have changed or the medium has changed. When that was happening, that person did it. was doing it well. So ask that because we're tempted and we're rewarded for a lot of things that can make us famous that are going to give us a proverbial hangover one day. Mm. Check in with those things. Yeah. All right. It, 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 it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a slippery line. It's very tempting, mm. but give yourself enough credit. Give yourself more credit to go. Is this who I really am? Is this who I want to be? Am I doing this because I love it and I'm good at it? Or am I doing this because I think it could get a lot of attention, mm. even though I don't believe in it, even though I'm going to probably regret it, deal with it later. Uh, don't, hold on, don't, don't, don't press in yet. Don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> hang on, hang on. Um, time is more on your side than you think. Yeah. Um, so just watch what you put out. And also, the things with like, and I'm leaning back into social media, that we just, with simple reminders for all of us, adults and our children, just remember those things you say, those likes and those dislikes, they're going to outlive you. They're going to outlive me. They're going to outlive all of us. They will be on our record. Mm. They will be on our great, 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 great grandchildren's record. Just think about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. just, just have a little, have a little touch to take a little inventory <laughs> before you go, Pyah! Right. <laughs> And, you know? and a follow up to that, what's the number one skill you wish you would have either learned or, or mastered before, you know, becoming really famous? Oh, uh, the number one skill. To be able to manage it or, or you know, navigate it. That number one skill for me would have been, and I did learn this about five years in my career, but preparation. Um, I had a run early on in my career where I thought I could just, I was better if I just winged it. Mm. Like, oh no, if I get prepared, I'm getting too mental. I'm thinking too much. I'm getting too hemleshing. I'm getting, no, 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 I'm an instinct guy, all right? And I embarrassed it out of myself really? um, in, 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 in a movie, in a role. Wow. And I was one of the most regretful things I've ever done. It's so embarrassing. And I learned preparation on that day and I still prepare. And I prepare so I can have freedom so I can wing it mm -hmm. so I can throw a chunk of the script away and go let's dance call audibles game time they didn't play the defense we thought they were we're reading the defense chunk the playbook here's what we're running then it's really fun yeah. you know but that comes you can only do that if you prepare the right way mm -hmm. your playbook or your roadmap whatever it is yeah. um, and I didn't understand that early Yeah. luckily I Figured it out, and I still got to work and got it. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I've got two final, the two final questions. That was a follow up, so I'm adding two more real quick. Um, the art of living. Make sure you guys go there. LHLiving.com. Go sign up. It's free. Be there. Invite a few friends. You're gonna have an amazing time. Um, I'm, I want to acknowledge you, McConaughey, for not half-assing it. I know it's mm. something that your dad talked about. Is that, you know, if you're going to go on this dream, this career, this path, yeah. don't half-ass it. Um, and I love the, the nod you added at the end of your book about not half-assing it. So I really acknowledge you for not half-assing it in every stage and season of life that you've gone after. And I really acknowledge you for how you've been able to be successful and also have a really beautiful marriage mm. and, and, and be a beautiful father. And I, and I know you talk about how you have C's in lots of these areas you talked about, not A's. Yeah. But the fact that you keep living the way you do and showing up with your heart, open-hearted, in service to people, I really acknowledge that for you, Matthew, for, for uh, your, your willingness to want to teach constantly and at the same time being a student amen. of life. Amen. Um, Thank you. I'm, tr I'm trying. I'm trying. I, I said, I ain't making A's and all, but I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> trying. And as you know, part of yeah. that's the deal. If we can get the right playbook and just keep getting back in the game yeah. each day. We yeah. ain't going to get there. We ain't going to get to the ta-da moment of, oh, I got it all figured out. That ain't happening. Sure. But if we can yeah. see how far along we can get while we're here. Um, Amen. I asked you this question before. So these final two questions, I'll ask them quickly. Um, the first one is called my three truths question. I asked you this before. 
If people want to see what those are, we'll have linked up the previous interview. We can see and compare your, your last interview, what your three truths were okay. to today, a couple of years later. A lot has happened in the last couple of years. And here's the question. Um, you get to live as long as you want. You get to continue to create, make art, write books, do programs, movies, everything you want to do, you get to do. But Forever? Remember, for as long as you live, but then the lights go out at some point. Okay. When they do, not like, you're not saying like, if you live forever. No, no, you're going to live for as long as you want, you know, another 50, 100, whatever years, however long you can extend your life. Okay. Then one day you got to turn off the lights. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you create and accomplish everything. Let's say you got another list of 20 goals. They all happen, you know, just like you did in 1992. Yeah. But for whatever reason, all of your work, all the movies, the books, the content is gone. Gone. Hypothetical. Okay. It's all gone. No one has access to it in this world anymore. Ever. (laughs) Ever. But you get to leave behind three truths with the world. And this is all we would have of your wisdom and information. (laughs) Three lessons, three truths that you can't roll in right now? (laughs) We're not taking a time out before this answer? I get to come back, write this one in on an email. Oh my goodness. Three three truths. Whatever is I answered this before last time? You did answer this before. Can you tell me what I said? I'll tell you afterwards. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Three truths. Whatever's on your heart or your mind Three right truths. Now. Three um, truths. Um, um, when in doubt, make a sense of humor, your default emotion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, don't make a straight line crooked. <laughs> and loving your kid's mama. This is one of the best things you can do as a parent. Mm. Final question. What's your definition of greatness? Of greatness. Mm-hmm. Greatness. Greatness. Par excellence. What is de- greatness? Not perfection. Greatness. Pursuit, capture, and proof. At the highest mortal level. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that one. That's good. What did I say? So Can I remember pursuit, that one? Capture and proof at the highest mortal level. You want to say it one more time? Yes. Pursuit, capture, and proof at the highest mortal level. Amen. I'll go with that. All right. And is there anything you want to, that's on your heart that you want to finish with? Anything that you want to share? Anything? Just um, this event that we're going to do for free. Please come join us and, and bring who you want. It, it should be, I don't think I'll say too many cuss words, but I, I think you can bring your kids to it and everything. It's going to be, we're going to talk about life, man. We're all trying to figure this thing out, aren't we? And we're all, we're all here. And the difference between saying we're stuck in it or we're saying, no, we're on the ride and we're mm-hmm. driving. It's about, you know, life's going to happen to us, but we can also, we also have our hands on the wheel. And that's what we're going to talk about, how our hands on the wheel, especially at this time in life after coming out of this, disruptive time with COVID in the last three or four years where all of our life was sort of disrupted and we were in limbo. It's time to make some choices and we can make choices to to, to, to have a solid step forward mm. on where we want to go because we can now see further than we could in the last four years. So that's the timing of it as well. So look forward to seeing mm. you there. We're going to have a hoot of a time. Mm. Matt, thanks yep. so much, man. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate Thank you, man. It. Yes. Awesome. What matters? A few subjects. Your body because your energy matters. That energy is low. Everything I just said is worthless to you. Because when you're low energy, you don't use your full intelligence or ability. And most of us have not moved so much because of the environment of COVID where everybody was pretty much locked down. And the point of the matter is most people, that energy has been lower. So you need energy. You need emotion. If you don't know how to master your emotion, 